Nā mai, haere mai, Rachel Froggatt, Chief Executive of Women in Sport Aotearoa and Secretary General of the International Working Group on Women in Sport, speaking to you from a very early morning in Auckland, New Zealand. Welcome to all of those that are, um, I hate to say it, probably lying in bed still in New Zealand, <laughs> uh, watching this on their iPads or their laptops. Welcome to you and also welcome to all of our audiences around the world. We've had an amazing response uh, to this particular episode of Leadership from Lockdown. And as soon as we announced that today's guest was coming to speak to us live from Zurich, um, we were overwhelmed by interest. So I'm personally really excited about today's episode. Um, I was thinking yesterday, I feel like I need to start the story with once upon a time, a long, long time ago, <laughs> when international travel was a thing, um, I met this guest uh, for the first time last November and had the privilege of spending about two hours with her actually uh, in the FIFA headquarters in Zurich. And uh, it was one of the best highlights I've had uh, in my time in the women in sport movement. So uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping bits. You will be able to ask questions of this guest as we go along, which is great. Our moderator today will be asking a few questions up front. One question we won't be able to answer today is anything to do with the Australia and New Zealand joint bid with regards to the FIFA Women's World Cup 2023, only because we want to preserve the integrity of that bid and, uh, and make sure that there's no questions asked of us about that. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our amazing moderator who has returned for week three, Ricky Swanell. <laughs> Ricky. Thanks, Rachel. Morning, everyone in New Zealand. And confession, I do still have my pyjama pants on in the bottom. And hello to everybody um, around the world. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, as Rachel said, if you're new to this, um, this situation, yes, do put your questions in and we'll get to them. But I'm going to get to our guest, Sarai Beerman, who is coming to us from Zurich. Sarai, thank you so, so much. First of all, I guess we always like to know what COVID life is like for everybody. So what is the situation like in Switzerland? What restrictions do you have? Uh, well, first, uh, thank you very much for, for having me. Um, I think this is a really, really cool initiative and it's a, it's a pleasure to, to be part of it. Um, for, for us in Switzerland, we're uh, just at the back end of our sixth week. Uh, in lockdown, so I'm, uh, I've had six weeks now in home office. Um, the situation I think is quite advanced um, compared to New Zealand and Australia. We've got, uh, we've just passed 28,000 uh, confirmed cases and we've got I think close to 1,300 deaths uh, now. Um, we're right on the border of Italy, which was the kind of epicenter in Europe, and uh, obviously we're also surrounded by France and Germany who have got um, quite high uh, levels of confirmed cases there as well. So it's been a, a really interesting time. Uh, one thing I have to say, uh, being in Switzerland, is that the Swiss people are, are very, very good at following rules <laughs> and, and regulations. So we've, we, it's been very, very orderly. Uh, there hasn't kind of been any panic buying or, um, you know, they're real sticklers uh, in that respect. But yeah, it's, it's a scary time for sure, especially to be away from family. You know, uh, my parents and, and my immediate family are all in New Zealand. Um, so it's, it's been a scary time to be away from them. Uh, but also quite, quite a nice time in terms of um, being proud of New Zealand and the response that they've had and particularly uh, Jacinda and her leadership. Uh, her popularity has just risen so massively during this time. So I'm, I'm happy to see that uh, things are, are being dealt with in New Zealand in a, in a really good way. Six, six weeks, um, and like I know you have been must have been incredibly busy work-wise, but how have you stayed sane? <laughs> yeah, I think... <laughs> Well, there's been some moments of uh, insanity, for sure, but I think it's, yeah, for me, the, the key thing has been establishing a routine, you know, so I have my little home office area set up on the dining table. Uh, my husband's working from home as well. His office is in the bedroom. So, you know, we try and establish like a, a normal work routine uh, to some extent. Um, Exercising has been really key, like online workouts and going for walks and, and getting a bit of sunshine. But then I think it's also okay now and then to have a PJ day where you're just 
stay in your pajamas and maybe work from bed and eat some junk food and you know I think it's it's really good to have those days as well because it's inevitable yeah well yeah I mean you, you have a massive role leading women's football globally how have how challenging has it been in the last six weeks or so what have the priorities been since we realized the severity of this yeah, uh, I think definitely first and foremost uh, is, is the health and, and well-being of, of everyone involved in football. You know, obviously starting from our immediate circle, our employees and, and the team, um, but then extending beyond that to, you know, the players, uh, the clubs, coaches, referees, everyone involved in the game. Um, and, and that's been the number one concern and, and the main driver behind, you know, any decisions that have been made during this time. Uh, obviously, football is really important to us, um, but it's certainly taken a back seat um, during this moment. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been very, very difficult. I think the just dealing with the team, you know, uh, leading my own team um, uh, through a period where it's a, it's a new a new situation, working from home, not having that same level of connectivity. Um, because we're an organisation uh, that has a lot of expatriates, there's a lot of uh, our employees who have uh, returned home to their home countries. There are many who weren't able to, who are separated from their families. So it's been an interesting time uh, within the organisation itself. And then obviously beyond that, we have our 211 uh, member associations that we also need to connect with. So it's been a, a very interesting time. <laughs> Yeah. to say the least. <laughs> yes, yeah, for sure. What, what's been the hardest or most difficult decision that you've had to make in the, in the last six weeks? Oh, um, <laughs> How long's the list? Yeah, I mean, to, to be honest, in terms of, of difficult decisions, uh, I actually think that the, the most uh, difficult decisions are, are ahead of us. Um, a lot of the decisions uh, to date have been quite easy to make because the, the basis has been around, you know, protecting everyone's health and safety and, and well-being. So things like postponing tournaments, um, cancelling uh, international windows uh, have been quite easy decisions in that respect. Um, but I think the, the hardest decisions will, are, are yet to come and they will be around uh, coming out of the situation and the return to, to normality. Mm. Yourself and, and World Rugby and the International Cricket Council, it's, I guess, sounded the alarm about the impacts of COVID-19 could have on women's sport. What are you collectively seeing or yourself as an individual that, that is concerning in that area for women's sport? Yeah, so we, uh, well, <laughs> I've, ha I've had this network for a little while now. Um, you may know Katie Sadlier, who is my counterpart in, in World Rugby. And we had, uh, actually, our positions were announced uh, respectively in rugby and football within a couple of weeks of each other a few years back. So we connected in New Zealand uh, before we headed to Europe. And uh, we've kept the network going. Uh, now we have also got international cricket involved in our counterpart there. So the, the conversations for us have been ongoing now for quite some time. And obviously with the coronavirus, uh, we share many of the same challenges. Uh, so we've got a kind of a weekly call that we jump on. Um, and I think for us, the, the main concern is um, linked a little bit to the old adage, which is, you know, the last in, first out, um, which often happens across many industries. And I think because uh, women's sports and or women's football, certainly at the elite end of the game, is relatively in its infancy, um, you know, it's, it's certainly some concerns around, you know, ensuring that the great momentum that we've achieved, uh, particularly in the last few years, um, and for football off the back of the Women's World Cup last year, uh, we don't take steps backwards to, to lose that momentum. Are there steps now, Sarai, that you can start to put in place or um, to, to start to mitigate that now? <clears throat> yeah, I think um, certainly in terms of uh, the support that we offer from FIFA level to our member associations, um, we can do a lot, I think, to accelerate that and, and to um, intensify it during this period. 
Um, we're, I'm in the second week now of uh, quite an intensive stakeholder consultation period where we're speaking with uh, member associations, clubs, players, leagues, uh, all the different stakeholders in football basically to try and uh, get an overview of, of what the impact has been um, and what the predicted impacts will be in the future. Um, and that will obviously help us to, to make clear decisions about the best way that we can support um, those stakeholders as we come out of the situation and, and during it now. Mm. You've got such a diverse range of stakeholders, um, <laughs> national, big national federations, smaller ones. I guess probably to relate here, people here are running the high performance ending community games. <laughs> so how do you meet those needs of such a massive diverse group of, of stakeholders? Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> I have to say that was probably one of the most difficult things to get my head around uh, when I came to FIFA a few years back. Um, I'd come uh, from the Pacific region, which obviously has its own unique uh, qualities and challenges, but certainly is, is not uh, to the same size <laughs> uh, as FIFA. So um, I think, yeah, for me, there was a, a steep learning curve in the beginning, for sure, um, particularly in, in territories like Europe. Um, for me, coming from the Pacific region um, and, and not having a, a great global exposure, you know, I had to learn quite a bit about uh, the European women's football landscape, uh, the same in South America. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting period for me when I first arrived. But I have to say that, um, you know, I started my football career uh, in Samoa. And uh, I was very fortunate to have a position there where I could uh, be hands-on involved in, in building the sport of football in the country there uh, after a, a difficult moment that they had financially. Um, and that experience for me has been absolutely invaluable because I was able to, to really see uh, firsthand what it takes uh, and what is needed to build a sport from the ground up at a national level and also to understand what the challenges and, and the obstacles are. So I often uh, still draw on those experiences that I had in Samoa and the Pacific region um, in, in my role now. But yeah, I, the key is, to be honest, uh, with that many stakeholders at so many different levels, it's to ensure that the support you offer can be tailor-made. So we have development programs and funding and different kinds of initiatives uh, and it's important to have a framework and, and some common objectives but to ensure that the support you offer can be tailored. So for example if we're supporting a, a league structure in Tonga as an example will be very different to the type of support we would offer to support a league structure in Germany. So it's just making sure that everything that we do is, is adaptable and, and can be tailor-made to meet the needs uh, of the specific country. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a worry or a, a danger in this time that the gap widens between the haves and the have-nots in, in global sport and in, and in football in particular? Yeah, I think that that's always a concern for us, um, particularly as women's football is emerging and becoming more... Uh, more and more of a commercial product. Um, obviously, we want to see competitive matches um, at the highest level and, you know, the widening gap in performance, which was quite evident at the Women's World Cup last year, um, is something that we, we want to obviously close. Um, in moments like this, I guess everyone has stopped, uh, the elite performers and the more developing countries as well. I think the, the key is, uh, those that are, I would say, less resourced in terms of funding um, and, and human resource, um, how do we support them uh, coming out of this where the more resourced countries, clubs, leagues, uh, obviously have more of a fund and, and um, more of a backup to dip into? Yeah, sure. I mean, your mandate as um, Chief, of, Chief Women's Football Officer for FIFA is something about doubling <laughs> the global playing base. So just taking it from a mere 30 million to about 60 million would be good if you could. <laughs> um, how, do you, how are you tracking with that strategy? And how do you even start on, on something yeah. like that? And how this, this may be impacted? 
Yeah, so we do have some lofty objectives. Uh, as you say, we want to uh, get 60 million women and girls playing football by 2026. Um, so that's something that is uh, constantly looming over me, I have to say. But I think after the Women's World Cup last year in France, um, we had a massive jump in participation numbers around the world, which has been really promising for us. Um, it showed us uh, a few things, the direct impact that a, a global competition like the World Cup can have uh, in terms of popularizing the sport. So um, that's something that we've paid a lot of attention to. Um, but also, you know, how having our athletes as role models, as ambassadors, uh, you know, prominent um, in terms of being household names makes a big impact as well in terms of attracting um, new players and young girls into the game. Um, <laughs> the strategy, uh, to be honest, is there's many different elements to it. Uh, I would say the key in terms of driving participation is competitions. Um, so we're putting a massive amount of resource and effort behind uh, supporting uh, our member countries to set up competitions uh, where they don't already exist and to enhance the ones that are there now. Because um, obviously if we're attracting uh, new players into the game in order to keep them there and to ensure that that growth is sustainable, they need to have regular competitions to compete in. So that's a big top-down driver. And with competitions comes uh, many other elements. So capacity building around coaches, referees, uh, administrators of the game. Um, so I would say competitions is, is the core in terms of participation. Mm. We'll move to some of the questions that are coming in because I always end up rushing to try and fit them all in at the end. So okay. <laughs> let's try and get to, get to them now. And um, thanks everyone for your questions and do keep, keep popping them in. Um, the under 17 and under 20 World Cups for, for females have been postponed. How do you see what the chances are of them going ahead and uh, does that um, eligibility change for the players around their ages with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So obviously both those tournaments have been uh, postponed. We had the under 20, which was uh, scheduled to take place in August this year in Costa Rica and Panama. Um, there it was um, very clear that the impact on the, on the virus in terms of infrastructure was going to make it quite hard for, for the two host countries to, to be able to deliver. And then the under 17 um, was scheduled for November in India. And I think the key issue for us there was linked to the qualifying competitions. So there were uh, very, very few of the countries um, who had qualified for the competition due to postponements of those competitions. So, yeah, it's, uh, I guess, uh, a, a really good question to, to, to try to understand when the best time that it can be rescheduled. Um, and obviously this is, uh, I don't think anyone has uh, any concrete ideas about when things will return to normal. Um, certainly in the host countries, we'll be able to monitor when uh, sports activities can come back to normal. Um, but there are other factors such as, you know, opening of the borders, uh, whether they're going to put teams into quarantine when they arrive into those countries. Um, the under 17s for us is a very sensitive age group. We're talking about school aged uh, kids. You know, I'm, I'm not a parent myself, but I, I certainly think I would be a bit apprehensive about sending my teenage daughter overseas uh, after a time like this. So there's so many factors uh, that we have to take into account. In terms of the eligibility, uh, we want to keep those same players uh, that would have been playing in the competition in, in the new competition. So we will uh, um, adjust the regulations to ensure that there's not a... Uh, a generational gap there. Mm, yeah, sure. Um, question here, in New Zealand there is a big push, it's just jumped up on me, hasn't it? Hang on, scroll up, scroll, there we go. In New Zealand there's a big push for, um, for women in governance roles within the sport and it is growing, but the number of women in key operational leadership roles, especially mm -hmm. at regional level, is quite low. Do you think our sport leaders should be encouraging those appointments rather than just focusing on boards? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, for us, it's uh, ensuring that women are present across the board at all levels. So on the pitch, uh, at administrative levels, in middle management and in the decision making bodies. 
And, you know, obviously the decision making bodies is where the, the key decisions are made. It's important that women are present there to ensure that, you know, there's a diversity um, uh, amongst those decision makers and, and in the end, a better decision making process. But of course, throughout the organisation as well. And maybe I'm a bit biased in saying this, but certainly from an operational point of view, in my experience, uh, certainly in football, it's often the, the women who are in uh, leadership positions on an operational point of view uh, that are the most organised. Um, they deliver you know, on time um, to higher standards and they don't get flustered under pressure as well. So well, I would I definitely advocate. <laughs> I guess this kind of follows on um, and, and then what advice would you give to someone who wants to um, step through those ranks in, in football or in other sports? Uh, well, <laughs> there's lots of, uh, I, I would say, uh, little tidbits of advice that I could give, uh, certainly from my own experience. I think one thing is uh, always to be confident in your own uh, ability and to be well prepared. Um, in the sports sector, it's uh, historically a male dominated industry um, and often as an, unfortunately is the case that women uh, have to work twice as hard to prove themselves. Um, so it's really important to be well prepared at all times to have a really clear knowledge and understanding of what your topic is. Um, so that when you do go to those meetings and into those discussions or forums, you know, um, you're standing on your own two feet in terms of your knowledge. Um, I think it's also good to utilize networks um, and, and to have a little bit of political savvy as well. Um, sports is a, a very political place and um, having an understanding of the politics and where the key decisions are taking place and who the key decision makers are and uh, working to align yourself with those people is also, I think, uh, important. Mm, sure, yeah. Um, what are some of the main challenges you have in selling women's football or, or women's sport? Selling. <laughs> so, I guess selling yeah. from a commercial perspective and selling from a, a, an eyeballs perspective. Yeah. Um, I think from a commercial perspective, the biggest challenge is, is just historical. Uh, women's football has always been seen as a cost exercise as opposed to a revenue generating exercise. Um, and in all honesty, there's still a, you know, a vast majority of our member associations um, and even women's leagues, which are heavily reliant on, on, on being subsidized by revenues from the men's game. And because of that, there's a, there's a mindset uh, in football that women's football is a cost. Um, and I think a, a lot of the work that we have to do is around changing that mindset and, and getting those leaders to understand that investing up front for a longer term gain is vital uh, in order to reap the opportunities that exist uh, in commercialising women's football. And I, I really strongly believe that the commercial value in football across both genders, uh, the biggest opportunity lies with the women's game. If you look at men's football now, it's just, it's completely saturated in terms of rights and commercialization, you know, player salaries, everything. It's just, it's completely saturated. And uh, in contrast, if you look at the women's game and you see the gap there between um, the men and, and women's game from a commercial perspective, it's clear to me where the opportunities lie. And, and that requires investment and, and the right mindset. Mm. Do you see, and it's something that's sort of popped up, I think, in the cricket space over the last 24 hours here, do you see female events getting bumped for the male equivalents or male events um, in this post-COVID world? And, and what's your philosophy when working through changes to future programs? Yeah, unfortunately, it's, it's, it is something that I see. Um, it's already happened in a few cases. Um, and yeah, a lot of that is based on economics. Um, you know, the, the football industry, like many other industries, is, is struggling at the moment financially. Um, many of our leagues and clubs and, and member countries are, are unable to fulfill their commercial obligations because activity has stopped, uh, which means that the revenues coming in have also stopped. Um, and, and typically those organisations, as a, as a knee-jerk reaction, they put all their energy and focus into where the revenues are coming from. 
Um, and at this stage, uh, it's predominantly from men's football, um, which is unfortunate. Um, but I think that, you know, particularly off the back of the Women's World Cup last year, women's football has risen to a level of prominence where even those leaders in football that are maybe not so into it uh, are forced to stand up and take notice and, and obliged to, to invest. And it's certainly uh, pressure coming from my end as well at FIFA level to ensure that that happens. It's <laughs> a very polite way of putting it. <laughs> Um, with regards to the competitions that you talked about um, before, regarding post-COVID again, um, will you go back to those previous structures and development programs or are there different, better ways that can cater to the women's game that aren't just replicating the men? Yeah. Yeah, I think this, is, this has been a really great moment to maybe take a bit of a step back and do some reflection um, and, and maybe push the reset button for sure. Um, I have a really dedicated team uh, who have been working quite hard um, during this period to really understand what the impacts have been and how we can adapt ourselves to ensure that the support that we give is, is optimised. Um, so there's definitely opportunities, I think, to um, enhance the programmes that we are offering. Um, and yeah, my main goal is to ensure that money uh, and funding and resource that should be earmarked for women's football uh, remains with the women's game and that, you know, it, it's not falling to the wayside, um, particularly as we come out of this situation. In some countries that are obviously struggling in the specific example here is Colombia, the, the female players, the, the contracts have been suspended or cancelled. How do you work with countries like that um, where there are such big gaps between the men and the women? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, a really difficult one um, because obviously the arrangements, uh, the contractual arrangements for players um, is often governed by what the situation is in the country itself and the employment laws that exist there. Um, FIFA has met with our confederations uh, a few weeks ago and put together some guiding principles around uh, con contracts um, uh, in particular. And yeah, obviously with seasons finishing and uh, stopping in advance of when they normally would, we, we are unfortunately seeing that some players are losing their contracts. But as part of those guiding principles, we're trying to encourage the clubs uh, and those players to to reach an agreement between themselves because obviously the welfare of the players is something that's really important for us. And women's football is a long way away uh, from you know the men's uh, professional football in terms of the salaries they get, the kind of conditions that they get. So they're not kind of living it up in their mansions uh, in their home gyms like uh, we see from Ronaldo on his Instagram account. It's a very different situation. So I think we have to be careful. Um, and we're quite lucky to have stakeholders like uh, FIFA Pro, which is the International Players Organization. They have very close contact with players and they're really on the pulse in terms of what's happening um, and the impacts on the players. So we'll be meeting with them shortly um, and the insights that they can give us um, is, are invaluable in that respect. There's actually a question here about FIFA Pro and, and how closely you've worked with them um, and your thoughts on, on the report on the implications for women's football. Yeah, I think that was a really interesting report uh, they published. Um, uh, certainly for us, it's something that we've used internally um, to, to help get that bigger picture of what the impact that this virus is having on our landscape. Um, the players are, are a really, really key stakeholder, obviously, in football. Um, you could argue they're the top stakeholder. Um, so having FIFA Pro as an organisation um, aligned with us and being able to, to gather information from them, like what they've put together in that report, um, is certainly very helpful. And I'm looking forward, actually, to having some discussions with them on how they see that we can uh, collectively um, support the female football players um, during this situation. A thing that sort of comes through in the last couple of weeks with these sessions is that the chance that this situation 
opens up new opportunities for women and 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 everyone in operational and leadership roles what opportunities do you see coming from this COVID situation that will give some positive change to to football and to women and women in sport in general yeah i think it's always been the case for me that it's moments of adversity are certainly where the biggest opportunities are lie um and in football this is definitely true um, and i can recall back to the the reforms of fifa in 2016 after the big scandal that happened um, which was a horrible time for football and for fifa but it actually presented uh, an amazing opportunity for women's football and women in football and it was actually due to that crisis that uh, we now have uh, you know women in in positions uh, in the fifa council we have a female general secretary now. Uh, I myself uh, am a member of the management board in FIFA. Um, and those things wouldn't have come about if, if we didn't go through that crisis. So I think there's definitely a moment uh, where, where women in sport and women sports in general can um, seize on opportunities coming out of this. I, I don't know what those opportunities will be, to be honest. I think a lot of it will come from leadership um, and just uh, women, the way that we seem to hold ourselves and, and Jacinda is a shining example of this. Um, in moments of crisis and the leadership that they demonstrate, I think, will lead to a lot of opportunities in itself in terms of decision making and within organisations moving forward, for sure. Mm. This question probably pertains more to your time in Samoa or New Zealand or your knowledge from that and, and sports relationship, which can be a bit uncomfortable with the reliance on, on gambling, um, gambling money and the pokey money. We know that there's going to be a big drop in that here in New Zealand. Is this a time where that can be a fundamental shift in the relationship, given you know, the state of the economies at, at grassroots and professional level? Yeah, I... Not sure I fully understand that question, but I think, well, I, I would hope at a time like this for sure, uh, particularly when there's a, a lot of um, economic hardship that gambling uh, would, would uh, decrease, obviously. Um, and, you know, there are obviously higher priorities in a moment like this. Um, but yeah, I, I I'm not sure I... You, um, I, I don't know if you remember, so a lot of the community funding for sport in New Zealand uh, came through the Pokey Trust and the, and the game. I see. Martin Sneddon last week, I think they give away 150 million, um, but that okay. can be half because obviously nobody's at the pub and the Pokey. Yeah. So can we yeah. start to move away from reliance on gambling money, um, TAB money and all yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, no, I, I see what you mean. Yeah. I recall that now from New Zealand. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that's going to create, in, in the initial phase, a very difficult moment because a lot of those sports, um, and if I recall, a lot of them are community clubs yeah. and community sports organisations um, that rely very heavily on that funding. So I think there will be a, quite a negative impact up front. Um, and until we're able to rebuild, but maybe it does present an opportunity to move away from that type of funding for sure. Um, and I would look to, you know, leadership from the government and regional sports organisations there, certainly Sport New Zealand, to, to see how um, in a time like this, we can look at alternative avenues of funding those um, community sports organisations, which are so, so vital um, in terms of community wellbeing, um, just activities at the grassroots level, so vital. So I hope that, yeah, we'll be able to find other avenues mm. of funding. Which segues me to this question. You're very inspiring. <laughs> Would you ever consider coming oh. home to New Zealand to take a leadership <laughs> role running sport here? <laughs> yeah, I've, um, well, I always consider New Zealand home. Um, you know, my, my parents are there. Um, my brothers and their families, all my nieces and nephews are there. Um, so it will always be home for me. Um, I guess at some point in the future, I, 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 would, I would definitely return home. My husband's family are there too. Um, but to be honest, I feel so passionate about what I'm doing now. You know, women's football is, is so deserved of of such a level of prioritization and activity and and 
you know, investment. And I feel that we're only at the beginning of, of, of where we can be in terms of the growth of our sport. And I guess I want to exhaust as much as I can, all the efforts I can towards that um, be before I make a move back home. <laughs> I can see you like you, when you're talking about the growth of women's football and what's ahead, like you, you're lighting up like how exciting <laughs> it is. Um, would then, oh, this is a, a sort of practical question, will FIFA look at running the, the coach mentorships program again for, for, for women? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. I think it's a really good program. Um, it addresses uh, some of the issues that we have in the women's game. I, for those that, that know it, um, you know, there's a real lack of opportunities for female coaches in our sport. Um, it's often the case that uh, many of the male coaches that don't make it uh, to the level that they want to in the men's game, they come across to, to women's football, um, often taking the opportunities that, that, that are, are there for the female coaches. So the Coach Mon Mentorship is a really cool program. Um, it's, it's based around connecting up and coming female coaches um, with well-established ones. So in the last edition, for example, we had Jill Ellis, who is the, the coach of the US women's national team when they won the, uh, the World Cup last year. We partnered her up with an up-and-coming coach, uh, Monica from Mexico, and, and just mentoring them, giving them career advice, um, giving them opportunities to travel into each other's training environments, um, and it's obviously a, a massive uh, a learning experience and a great opportunity for those young coaches coming through, but also a really, really nice chance for those established coaches to give back uh, to the game as well. What's your hope um, once this pandemic is contained and, and for tournaments to start taking place again? I mean, how far away realistically are we from that? And, and like we said, the concern of the men's events taking precedence. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first thing is to look at the domestic level. So nationally, um, I think it's really important that we get the women's leagues and the youth leagues up and running again, first and foremost. Um, that's really the bread and butter. That's where football comes from. Um, those leagues and club competitions that are happening at national level is the foundation for everything. And at the moment, all that activity has stopped. So I think we, you know, certainly from a FIFA perspective, a lot of our focus is around ensuring that those domestic competitions can continue. Um, and then obviously we look at the regional level next. So the confederations, uh, you may have seen, for example, that the UEFA Women's Euro, which is the big European championship uh, has been moved back to 2022 now. So the calendar, the competition calendar is like a big jigsaw puzzle. And uh, already before this crisis, there was, um, it was, it's like a balancing act where you have to fit in the club competitions and leagues. Then you've got obviously national team competitions at regional level. Then you have the FIFA World Cups and trying to fit that all into a puzzle um, outside of a coronavirus situation is already quite difficult. Now we're going to see a, a condensed calendar because a lot of these competitions have been postponed and postponed. Um, so I think it's inevitable that in the next few years, there's going to be massive overlaps for sure, um, which I think for many sports fans is, is going to be amazing, to be honest, because uh, there'll be back-to-back -back tournaments uh, happening, I think both in men's and women's. Um, but yeah, I, I hope to see a, a return to normality um, as soon as possible. Um, as long as everyone can be safe and, you know, the, we're, we're aligning obviously with the government's um, international travel, borders being opened, all those kinds of things. There's so many considerations. Mm -hmm. We're seeing here in New Zealand, but I mean, I'm sure around the world that national federations are struggling financially. Will an organisation like New Zealand Football um, receive financial support from FIFA? Yeah, so part of the, the work that we've been doing over the last couple of weeks is uh, interviewing our member associations uh, to really understand uh, the impacts and what they're going through. Um, obviously from an organisational perspective, but financially as well. 
Um, and that information is, is going to feed into an overall uh, process where uh, we will have a support fund, um, which we offer to our member associations um, to support them during this period. And I guess the main thing we're doing now is understanding where is the best place for those funds to be directed. And my role within that is to make sure some of those funds go to women's football. <laughs> Good luck. Um, I'll probably just be able to squeeze um, one more in here. And, and I guess it's um, advice for women in developing countries. And we have got a few in from, from various places around the world here. So uh, about, I guess, having the right qualifications as such, or just getting in and boots in at the ground in those, in those developing countries. Yeah, I, th I mean, I'm a huge advocate for just getting in and rolling your sleeves up and doing the work. Um, I myself don't have uh, qualifications. I didn't come through an educational pathway to get where I am. Um, it was all, you know, hands on, getting on the ground, getting involved, understanding it and, and, and working through it. And I think, um, you know, in the Pacific region, I'm always fond, uh, fondly thinking of the woman that we have working in the game in the Pacific in particular, which is considered to be a developing region because it's all hands on deck. You know, in the women's game, it's often the same person that's doing the, the media and the social media and communication is also dealing with the competitions and the development programs and the national team programs. So it's, we're kind of coming from a place where you're forced to kind of just roll your sleeves up and get it done. And if you do that with integrity, um, and you back yourself and you, you, you know, make sure that you have a high level of knowledge about the, the area that you're working in. Um, yeah, hopefully that will help uh, those women to progress. And I think certainly for, for people like me um, and, and my colleagues and those of us that are in positions where we've uh, been fortunate enough to um, progress in our careers, it's important also that we give a hand to those women that are coming through. Um, and open up doors for them and opportunities as well. Awesome. It's probably a perfect place to finish. I'm sorry, I tried so hard to get through all the questions. There's so many more there. I, I do apologise to, to those, but hopefully um, we covered plenty. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to hand over um, to Sharon to, to wrap us up for today and then some final words from you. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. And thank you so much, Sarah. What a beautiful way to start our day here in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll thank you formally in a moment. Um, to everyone who's online with us, you're seeing now a poll that's come up in front of you. We'd ask you to take a few moments to answer the questions. How do you feel as a professional now in the current environment? Is the New Zealand government doing a good job in the current environment? For your business planning, what is your estimate of when this will be over? And your priority of increasing the inclusion of women and girls in your business recovery phase. So I'll give you a couple of moments to answer those. And while I do, Sarai, thank you so much for your time, for joining us mm -hmm. this evening and beaming into our bedrooms while we have breakfast. <laughs> it's been an absolute honour to host you. Um, you know, I just wanted to thank you for being so open and honest with us. Um, really was very inspirational. And um, I'm sure on behalf of Rachel and Women mm -hmm. in Sport Aotearoa, just wanted to thank you for your time and do look forward to seeing you back in New Zealand when this is all over. <laughs> so, <laughs> the results are coming to you now. Uh, brilliant as we're all feeling innovative overall, which is great. 85% uh, of us thinking the government is doing a good job in this crisis. Uh, 12 months has been what we're seeing as a trend this week for when our estimate of when this will be over. And the priority to include women and girls in your recovery phase, 70% of us are thinking that, which is brilliant. Ricky, thank you so much for your time as well this morning. Sarai, I'll hand over to you for the last words before we close uh -huh. off. Yeah, I guess uh, just to say thank you very much. Uh, I think it's initiatives like these actually that are really important in a moment like this. And certainly uh, being a woman in sport, um, and I know this is about leadership, but I, I'd like to maybe focus in a little bit about, you know, the way that we react uh, as women in a crisis like this, I think is really, really important um, within our organizations and also within our communities. And, you know, you don't have to be in a position of leadership to be able to affect change during a time like this and to make a positive impact. Sometimes it's just about picking up the phone, sending an email, sending a short message, uh, having a conversation, even posting a, a card or a note or something can make such a huge impact. 
Um, and yeah, obviously I'm really uh, happy to be involved and uh, very happy to also take ideas and feedback from people, uh, particularly from our member country. So thank you all for tuning in. I'm not sure where you all are. And I, I think my mum is watching somewhere. Um, but yeah, I hope I was able to give you some insights and uh, thank you very much. Beautiful, thank you so much.